Gordon Glenister, thanks a lot for being here, buddy. Oh, lovely. Lovely to be here. I started, actually, in the influencer marketing industry almost by accident. It's insane, isn't it? Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants to be an influencer. We're now scrolling the average of the Eiffel Tower on our phones on a daily basis. Really? It's all about the dwell time. It's getting them past the first two, you know, two, three, four, five seconds. Which is why stuff like YouTube Shorts and short-form content has been huge. The influencer platforms, there are nearly 1,300 now. Massive numbers, isn't it? It's almost like... A dating scenario. People don't want to be sold to. Where do you think they're going wrong, the big guys? Never ever forget your fan base on the way up because they won't forget you on your way down. Where's the industry going? Computer generated influencers. How do we know as viewers who to trust? What we like about influencer content, it works because it's much more organic, it's, it's authentic. Guys, Matt Haycock's here, and welcome to another episode of the Matt Haycock Show. We're having a bit of a, a change of pace of late. We've been uh, been recording quite a few um, interviews with with celebrities, media personalities, but I'm excited to be getting back to my roots of business <laughs> and uh, having a guest on today where we can uh, learn some solid, actionable business advice that I'm sure I'm going to be learning from, and uh, on all you guys watching and listening can implement yourselves as well. I've got with me today Gordon Glenister. He's an entrepreneur, he's an influencer marketing expert, he's an author, I've got a nice little copy of his book here, and um, we're going to be talking, well, we're going to be talking about branding, personal branding, influencer marketing, mm -hmm. uh, and everything surrounding that, I guess. Mm -hmm. We're also having our breakfast here, so this really is a, this is a multitasking podcast, <laughs> bre bre breakfast with a boss, as I'm now, <laughs> now going to call it as, uh, as our new episode, but uh, Gordon, thanks a lot for being here, buddy. Oh, lovely, lovely I, to be here. I love the setup as well, it's cool. You and I talked a bit uh, off camera before we started recording, so I know, uh, I know there's going to be lots of stuff that I'm looking forward to digging into here as well, but... I guess just uh, just just give us a bit of a rundown about what qualifies you to be here. You know, what why you're an expert influencer marketer and uh, why everyone should be listening to you. Yeah, well, great. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I um, I started actually in the influencer marketing industry almost by accident because uh, for many years, uh, Matt, I thought I'd be in the promotional merchandise industry. So I used to head up the industry body, the British Promotional Merchandise Association, for eleven years. Loved it. But after 11 years, and I felt like I'd pretty much done whatever I could have done there, uh, in 2018, I decided to uh, launch my own consultancy, actually, to help other uh, associations, professional membership bodies, because it was an area that I was very familiar with. And um, I, I remember meeting up with the Branded Content Marketing Association boss, who's a friend of mine, Andrew Cantor, and we met in a Soho hotel in London. Uh, we were just talking about potentially some work that we could do together, maybe, uh, and then during that uh, during that chat, uh, I said to him, what about this whole influencer industry? I mean, it's insane, isn't it? Everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants to be an influencer. It's rapidly growing. But who's representing their interests? There's not like a trade body for them. So he's like mouth open as if to say, oh, my God, you're right. So we decided to launch a division of the uh, a brand of content marketing association. Oh, when you influence. say representing influencers uh, and a trade or the body, the, the the influencer agencies, the brand, anybody involved in the influencer but, but, industry. So, and literally, you know, this would be everyone from you know a Logan Paul at the extreme down to you know M Mrs. Smith, the micro influencer. Well, it could be, but we actually started to focus quite a lot of our energies on recruiting influencer agencies and influencer platforms. Okay. So these are the, these are the experts that help run campaigns. Um, and the only reason we did that is because, uh, to be honest, <laughs> working and dealing with influencers has its challenges at times. <laughs> and they are, a lot of them, of course, entrepreneurs. They are individuals that work on their own. So we, we realized that whilst we wanted to support the industry, we felt that actually the way to do that was through the influencer talent agencies, was through the influencer platforms, of which, by the way, there are nearly 1,300 now. This is worldwide? Or? Yeah, worldwide. And these, these are effectively like databases of influencers, some of which have got like 100 million uh, content creators and influencers on their database, which means that you can source people uh, and find out so much information about these uh, influencers before you uh, 
decide to go ahead with a campaign. It's a massive number, isn't it? I mean, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe we can maybe talk some of the specifics later, but I've, re I've been reading recently about, I'm going to say, is it, is it Korean, Korean Uber drivers or, or some, some kind of, some kind of um, country in that direction where the Uber drivers and the Deliveroo drivers have become like mini influencers in themselves and they're, they're making content, you know, based around the days. I mean, they're not making enough money to not do what they do. Absolutely, it's yeah. it's yeah. Um, it's supplemental to that. But um, you know, it was it was quite quite interesting to see the different kinds of content that people do do it's, want to see. It's so fascinating to see uh, the real variety of content. I mean, TikTok has exploded over the last few years, as many of your listeners and viewers will know, and that's largely because the content entertains us. What's happened, of course, now is our attention is, got, is getting less and less and less. In fact, um, we're now scrolling the average of the Eiffel Tower on our phones on a daily basis. Really? You know, you think about how tall that is. So if you're not grabbing the attention of your audience very, very quickly, you know, and so there's a lot of tactics that people are now using to bring you into that content and draw you up. I mean, you may have seen something, you see some videos which start at the feet and they're like drawing you up or they're, they're giving you a bit of a, what we call a teaser type of uh, a, a video, all designed to, to keep you, because it's all about the dwell time, the amount of time that you are watching the video. That is what the algorithm uh, rates quite highly and whether or not the audience is saving that video. Well, it's something that I mean, we've been working very hard on ourselves over the last, you know, probably the last couple of months with the po with our podcast, because you know, it's, I I often have great interviews, and I, I know I say it myself, but you know, great interviews with really interesting people. Where I know people would love to watch that content, if only they could get their head into the space of watching that content, and it and it's so difficult to keep anyone's attention now. And we've we've effectively almost started not putting more effort into the trailers than into the actual production of the podcast because you know what once you know if someone starts to listen to this conversation once or two three four minutes in you know they're either gonna they're either gonna want to listen or they're not if Correct. you don't want to listen to this after three or four minutes you know there's nothing we can do then you know you're not gonna like it are you but it's getting them past the first two you know two three four five seconds really which is why stuff like youtube shorts and short form content has been huge and they're often effectively great ways to get people to, to discover you and find you um Another interesting thing, of course, is is that when people put something on their social media, they all some people automatically think it's that. Do you not see my post? Have you not had that conversation with people? Yep. I put that post, there. and of course, no. The reason is is because uh, when you piece of put a content up, content up, the content is only going to be shown by about five percent of your audience a very very small percentage and if they like and share and comment in other words engage with that content it will push it out to more and of course if people are doing that very very quickly on a big scale that's how you get to sort of viral status um uh, well look just let's, let's take a pause for a second because i want to i want to go deep on, on some of this particular influencer marketing strategies and, and and some of the things that you've learned and implemented but i guess for Whilst we probably we all like to think everyone knows what influencer marketing is and who influencers are, can we just define and dig dig a bit deep on the term influencer as well? Because it's it's funny. I was having a conversation with someone semi recently, uh, a more old school friend of mine who's absolutely not in the space of uh, of branding and uh, and social media and I guess you know trying trying to grab attention. And he was making reference to the, you know, this new concept of influencers. Uh, and, you know, where I was trying to go with the conversation with him is, you know, the concept of an influencer is is as old as as old as old time. 100%. You know, more people know about it now and think about it in a different way because it's influencers on social media. But there's always been influencers and we have always been influenced by somebody. Now, whether that's as a, a one, two, three year old who's influenced by your parents because that's somebody that, you know, at that age, you know, you still look up to, you still love, or when you're 18, 19, 20 and you're going, you're going around town and the nightclubs and the bars that you go to are the ones where we've all got that key mate or those one or two key mates 
you know, whether it's you know the the guy who's head of the sports team or the or the best looking girl or whatever who who everybody follows on their journey around the particular bars. But you know the the concept of being an influencer is is nothing new. I mean, no. this this is just a a new way to harness it. Um, you know, I guess digitally and and at scale. So uh, yeah, let's just talk a little around that, and then we can start to get into some strategies. Yeah, I mean it's it's like as you say, it's Emperor's New Clothes. It's just a new. I mean, it's what I call word of mouth marketing. It used to be that's what it used to be be called i mean it's fundamentally the ability to influence the marketing the ability to engage uh, individuals who have uh, the ability to influence and change the behavior of others often through content behavior opinion or thought leadership um, and any anybody can be an influencer and it's not about you know i think sometimes the media have given it some a little bit of uh, an injustice by saying oh well you've got to have a hundred thousand followers or you've got to be a kim kardashian or you've got to be something huge you can be an influencer with as little as a few hundred or thousand followers what matters is is the follower relevance that is absolutely critical. So for me, you could be like a, a scientist and still be an influencer. Uh, but if you had people that were genuinely interested in your subject matter and of uh, high ranking, then actually you are more valuable to a brand or, a, or anybody else than, than, than somebody that's got 50, 60,000. Um, what's important is, is also, and there are great tools out there now, that enable us to spot fake followers, uh, you know, and you, if you have bots or fake f followers that are following you at the moment, you want to get rid of those because it's not about the numbers. It's about the engagement rate. That's the, one of the most critical metrics that brands use when they're wanting to work with influencers, because ultimately they want the content that the influencers are creating with their brand involved in it to work. And that's not going to work if they've got the wrong audience. And what 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 is a good engagement rate? Do you think nowadays? And I would assume it's probably declining. Is it? Yeah, I mean, on Instagram, one point six percent. In most instances, that's good. It's an average. But what? Whenever I've been involved in influencer campaigns, we would often try and look for around three uh, percent. Right. And that is now that the reason it's I say that is because it's really, really important to find the right people that resonate with that brand's values. That's critical. It's almost like a dating scenario. You are trying to find somebody that believes, you know, if you've got a um a, a product that's totally geared towards you're opening a vegan restaurant, for example, in London. Well, it's fair to say that you don't want just any types of foodies, you'd, you'd ideally want to have people that have an interest in vegan because the people that are following that influencer are more likely to also have an interest in vegan influencers. Now, the other thing that's really important is where those followers are based. And this is why there is amazing tools. So again, let's just take that scenario. We're opening a restaurant. We found a typical influencer, but actually, uh, 75% of their audience is based around the world, which means that it, my investment with that influencer, uh, potentially 75% of that is wasted because they're not going to show up to the new restaurant opening. So um, also, if, for example, uh, I've got a brand that is very much geared towards women, like a perfume or something like that, I want to make sure that the, the right people, so if I've found an influencer, Am I targeting the people that are buying that, i.e. other women? Well, it could be men, of course, but largely. Um, you want to make sure that you've got all the demographic. And that's nothing, new. that's nothing new. When you're buying media, you're buying an audience. The difference you have with influencer marketing is you're dealing with people. So they've got, they've got natural storytelling skills, which you don't have in a, in a newspaper ad or a magazine ad or a, or a radio ad, you know, people don't want to be sold to in today's society. They want to feel like they are learning something from somebody. Uh, they are entertained by somebody or being inspired by somebody. And where do you go to to get this demographic information and all these all this deep data? So there's a number of tools. I've got 
25 of them on my website uh, if anybody's interested in having a look and, and trialing any of them. Um, where's that? You can plug yourself again at the end, but just for anyone listening now, where's that website? Uh, just gordonglenister.com. <laughs> um, but it's just an example of where you can find uh, lots and lots of information. You can also find, Matt, um, the interests of the followers as well. I mean, it's fantastic data. And if you're a brand, let's be honest, more and more, you want to make sure that your message is getting to the right audience. And that's, of course, why Facebook advertising has been popular over the years, because of this very, very uh, fine-tuned targeting. Well, with influencer marketing, you can do that you know, even, even greater. I mean, let's just take one step back from the influencer marketing, because you've mentioned a few times now about, about the right brand and, and, and defining your brand. Uh, I mean, I guess ultimately all these influencers are are digital personifications of their personal brand. Correct. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much work you do in the personal brand space, but um, you know, what's what's your advice to anyone? Um, let's say anyone non celebrity uh, who wants to build a personal brand, or maybe even more interestingly, thinks that they they don't need to build a personal brand. Yeah. Because again, I, I hear that all the time, particularly from people in. Like more traditional industries, you know, financial services, you know, legal, anything to do with business. Oh, you know, I don't, personal branding is not for me. I don't need all that brand brand business. But, you know, obviously what people don't understand is you already have a brand anyway. Absolutely. And is it going to be a brand that's built on supposition and rumor from everybody else? Or is it going to be a brand where you can kind of try and control and dictate that narrative? Well, I have a whole program that talks, does exactly that. And quite frankly, um, one of my great phrases is a brand is what somebody says about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right by saying, uh, you know, it is what what people are perceiving you to be, whether you like it or not. What what we want more than that, more than ever, is we want trust and we want authenticity. We want to know when you when you look at Simon Calder, for example, talking about what's happening around the world of travel. You know, he's a great little personality. He's on all the media outwards. He just exudes trust. You know that he's going to tell you what's going on with EasyJet or with with destinations around the world. But tell me, but when you say if you know he exudes trust and, and and we know to trust him, I mean, but how how do you build that trust or how do we know as viewers who to trust? Because I think as well, you know, the. the there is very much a perception nowadays that you know if something said it's true, uh, and therefore you know all these people on so on social media, they are um, you know if they said something, but it must be true. You know that, that, you know some seventeen year old kid who's hired a Ferrari for the day to you know to to make a video talking about how he's how he's earned this after quitting school at six years old and blah blah, blah and. Everyone, everyone believes it. Yeah. Um, but how, how do we really know who to trust, or is that just a level of common sense? Well, it's it's um, <clears throat> one of the things I try and look at when I'm working with some of my clients is finding uh, a unique proposition about you. So, for example, um, I was working with a client uh, recently, and she runs a fashion business in South Wales. Yeah, she's been doing it for many, many years. And we've been working together. And I said, have you been to London Fashion Week? And she said, yes, I've been to London Fashion Week. And I said, have you really been to London Fashion Week? So I said, how about you have your own show? And she just thought, she just really just thought it was for the big major brands and it wasn't going to be possible or far too expensive. Anyway... That came to fruition on the just Friday uh, past. And to see her, and we choreographed everything, by the way. I had her on the microphone. Um, and, and we was in a church, an amazing church in Hyde Park. And the length of the models walking down the runway had all of her customers there. Some had come all the way from Wales. It was a spectacular experience. So a lot of actually building a personal brand, funny enough, is self-belief. Because people don't think, they see others around them in their own sector and they think, oh, I can never be as big as that person or they own it. Everybody has the ability to grow and develop their personal brand, but they do it in a way that is it is right for them. You know, what's right for one person doesn't mean to say it's right for everybody. Um, I mean, obviously, in her case, Karen's case, we're also looking at creating a podcast. But here's the interesting thing is, I know she has an amazing impact on 
on her audience. She does Facebook lives and she has um, she has a really big audience of women over 40. And she when I see the comments of people that love her stuff, I mean, it's, it's huge. So I've been working with her and I just said, you know what? You are so much more than just a fashion entrepreneur. You have the ability to make people feel good about their clothes and about what they wear. So we're creating a podcast together and we actually want people that are in that. What, what, are, people, what are women over 40 worry about? What are they concerned about? Menopause. Dating, menopause, all these other things. So we're going to create a podcast around all of that. Now, that is not only positioning her as a speaker, as an authority of women over 40, but also a very successful entrepreneur. And, and therefore, you know, her business will grow hugely as a result of doing that because people want to find something that they can relate to. So being highly influential, you've got to, do, you've got to be a, a number of things. I think you've got to be nice, actually, <laughs> because uh, taking time, I'll never forget uh, in the book, actually, uh, Taylor Swift, before she became famous, what she did a lot of the, or in the early years of her fame, she spent like four hours on the walkabout mm -hmm. taking pictures and videos for her fans that had come out and supported her. And she realized very astutely that that user generated content would buy so much more in terms of her influence than her just saying it, yeah? Because what we really want is we want other people talking about us rather than us talking yep. about ourselves all the time. Otherwise, it looks a bit like we're yep. showing off. Um, so I think uh, you always need to listen to your audience. You need to be respectful of their needs, engage with the comments on your social um, obviously, writing a book is a very great thing to do because it gives you a position of authority. And the reason why I'm quite proud about the book is because I did it actually without a lot of knowledge about the sector. I'd come from a promotional merchandise industry and I realized there wasn't really a great book on influencer marketing. And I had huge imposter syndrome writing that book, actually, because here am I into a brand new sector. And I thought, how am I going to make this fly? There's only so much information I can gleam on the, on the internet. So I interviewed some of the biggest names in the influencer marketing industry. And that in itself was an influencer concept because by the time it was released and launched, all those people had shared it and commented. And I had 150 people to my online book launch. <laughs> did, you, did you interview them on a podcast? Uh, no, no, no. I um, could have doubled up there. I could have doubled that probably, yes. <laughs> uh, so, some have since been on my podcast, uh, admittedly, um, but um, uh, it's been it's been a, it's been a great journey, and I think probably the most satisfying event of my entire life was last June, sat at the Business Book Awards, and to be sat there amongst these amazing authors from all around the world. Uh, and be a be a finalist for the Business Book of the Year Awards. Bear in mind, I hadn't written a book before, so that do you know what that really rebuilt my confidence. So when I when I say I had imposter syndrome, that imposter syndrome is just what's going on in my head. Um, and every entrepreneur that I know has it, or we all have it at some stage. We all have those self doubts, and yet actually, if you have the courage and you work with people and you ask for their help and advice. One of the things I've always done in my life is collaborate with people. I'm sure you have as well. It's Absolutely. a it's a very, very great way to build business together because, you know, a lot of people see me as a trustworthy individual because of what I put out online, because of the company I surround myself with and the, the tone, the pitch, all of those things. And that's what I want to create, a persona of trust. Where do you think what people would constitute the big influences go wrong? And I guess it's probably a, a leading question to my opinion, because I think you know, Joe Public, when we talk about influencers, they naturally gravitate towards more media personalities, you know, someone who's been on Love Island, someone who's been on you know, been on TOWIE or something. And you know, obviously they are, they are an influencer. Um, but I also think that they, because they probably come with a, an arrogance of celebrity. Exactly. They make 
all of the business mistakes, if you like, that ultimately don't give them any longevity. Whereas some of the people I would say you are better learning from if you want to want to learn about influencer marketing is the micro influencers in whatever particular niche they're in, because they've they've had to build that uh, you know they've had to build that audience up, they've had to build that credibility up from zero. Correct. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's, it's easy when you've been on telly, but you know when you go on Love Island last two or three or four weeks, it's quite it's easy-ish to walk off with an immediate base of two, three, four hundred thousand followers just because people naturally go, ah, oh, you know, there's Claire. Let's let's follow her, but they probably lose interest in them very very rapidly uh, if they've got no, nothing to offer. Whereas your micro influencers, uh, they've kind of you know, they've started from nothing. They've had to follow a, a you know a very prescriptive rule book. Um, I've, put, I've kind of half answered answer my own question, but you know <laughs> where, where, um, where 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 do you think they're going wrong, the big guys, and what could they do better? Well, I think you're absolutely right with a sense of arrogance and entitlement, and I always say never ever forget your fan base on the way up because they won't forget you on your way down. <laughs> I mean, look what's happened with certain media celebrities in the news of late. You know, they've got huge audiences. So Russell Brand. <coughs> yes, well. <laughs> um, but look, 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 look how quickly um, somebody's career can fall apart. So, you know, what I think is important is that you treat every follower as a handshake. If you were going to an event and I, we were like when we met, first of all, we shook each other's hands to say, hello, nice to meet you. Well, why would we not do that online? Why would we not show common courtesy? If somebody, if a, if a follower or somebody that's subscribed has asked a question, don't go, don't let it go unanswered. Mm. So if you're a bigger or uh, individual, I mean, Gary V, for example, is a very impressive 9 million followers and whatever, but he actually does have a social media team that echo his values and make sure that he is responsive. Now, admittedly, he's not going to be able to respond to all of them, but at least his team will. Um, and I think that's very, very important. Whereas with a micro and indeed a nano influencer, which is one to 10,000 followers, they're even more receptive because they've got uh, higher levels of engagement. They're able to react better. And remember, Matt, it's not about the follower count. Followers you know, are, are vain metrics. What matters is engagement at moving through down the sales funnel, you know? So when I, whenever, we, whenever we run influencer campaigns, you know, we'll ask the client, what are you hoping to achieve? And sometimes we just want to drive sales. And if that's the case, we might actually get a number of micro-influencers that are very driven in that niche. Whereas if it's brand awareness, i.e. reach and exposure, we might actually go further up the tree with a with a macro or celebrity influence. Do you think um, Do you think both strategies still apply, or or is the market moving a bit? I mean, I, I've had um, a couple of conversations recently with um, with agents who who represent both mac macro and micro influencers, uh, and they're saying that they're finding that people, well, sort of in brands who are booking them for campaigns, are wanting to go uh, less of. Let's let's say they had a ten grand budget typically, and they were going to do two posts for five grand each. You know, with with, with a more mainstream figure. Uh, these agencies are telling me now that they'd rather take that budget and instead of doing two posts, you know, with two big figures, they'll go and do two hundred posts with you know fifty fifty little uh, micro influencers. Absolutely, and the and that there's a good there's a good reason for that because actually one of the things that a brand can do with working with micros and nanos is have multiple niches. So, for example, we uh, I did a, a on one of the podcasts I did. Um, I said it was influencers are the new retailers. Yeah, that's what I was basically saying. And we interviewed five fashion influencers. And one of them was um, a content creator based in Edinburgh uh, from a diverse background, actually. W great lady, really smart. Uh, and she was, uh, she was putting out some content that wouldn't, normally be associated it was very quintessential english perhaps wouldn't normally be associated with that community uh anyway some of the responses that she was getting um was so strong like love your content really really cool i hadn't even thought that i could align myself with that brand until i saw your content now that is liquid gold for a brand so can you imagine by having a number of different 
influencers, you can tap into all sorts of different demographics better than perhaps if you were to go down that one single route. Uh, and the other thing I think is to think about is boosting through paid advertising. Because just as I said earlier, the content is only going to be shown by a small percentage of people. Unfortunately, that is also the case with an influencer. So if you if you need to get more eyeballs on that content, you can use that content either in your own social media, as long as that's been agreed as part of the brief and contract, or um, you can just put some paid advertising and just boost it through Facebook or Google advertising. Would you say that you should be that the influence, influencer themselves should be doing that boost, obviously with your money, your budget, but pr I presume they should do the boosting from their account because it's going going to their audience. It can be, yeah, it can be. Um, and I think, I think fundamentally what we like about influencer content, it works because it's much more organic, it's, it's authentic rather than some of the, 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 the paid, sorry, the, the ads that feel like they're, you know, not not in the same environment, should I say? Well, I think you've mentioned the word authenticity a couple of times while yeah. we've been talking. I think you know that, that's that's one of the key things where, where uh, particularly the bigger brands, you know, the, the brands that uh, are so corporately controlled with so much hierarchy and paperwork and bullshit to get anything done, I think you know, go wrong using influencers almost to the point that you you question why even bother using them because if you're going to use these influencers who've all got their own style, their own characteristics, and their own audience demographic. You're hiring them because they obviously know what they're talking about to have built that audience. Let them go do it. Absolutely. You know, like, yeah. I mean, I did it on a very micro scale recently when we were promoting this podcast, actually. I mean, we, we, we got 20 or 30 micro influencers to do some promotion um, of, of reels from this. But I just said to them all, go on the, go on the podcast homepage and pick your favorite podcasts and show that you know okay yes it might have been i might have really wanted to promote the gordon you know social media social influencer po podcast but what's the point if that if that's not not fitting fitting their demographic exactly you know, we right had, we had girls we had guys we had sporty people we had uh, all kinds of different people and i just said right go and go and find your favorite podcast and sh and share them accordingly with a comment in the same way that you write it i think you know for me if you've got a brand that's that's what you've got to do y yes you might need to give them some loose guidelines like you know i don't know don't do something that's going to disrespect my product or you know don't put a can of coke next to a can of pepsi but other than that let them go and do what they're good at. A hundred percent. And of course, that's why, that's why I said, you know, a lot of the times these are the new creative agencies. They are very, very creative people. And what they don't like, by the way, is to be brought in at the end of a campaign. In other words, the whole idea of it is you just go and amplify it. Because so often they're, they're worth a lot more than that. So if you were to be in a position where you're thinking of working with some creative influencers, um, Bring them into the to the brainstorming session. We'd like to work with you on a potential campaign. These are our ideas, but what do you think uh, could work really, really well? So tap into their creative juices. Allow them enough time to create that content and plan it. Brief them well. And this is another big issue with brands. They just think, actually, um, by here's their Instagram or go and have a look at our website or something. And you wouldn't do that if you were hiring a salesperson to work with you in your business. So make sure that you have given them all the features and benefits of these particular products. Make them aware of the competitors, maybe. Make sure that you've used the proper uh, hashtags so you can monitor exactly what is uh, what is going through that. Um, but yeah, don't be so prescriptive because you're hiring them as their expertise in being able to... Uh, I've heard it countless times before where people have said to me, well, they've advised a brand and they've said that isn't going to work because in that tone of voice, my, it wouldn't land. Might I suggest this? And the brand has come back and said, no, no, we want you to say this. Yeah. They've done it and it hasn't, it hasn't gone down that well. And then, you know, it's frustrating for the influencer, actually, because fundamentally they have a vested interest in mm. making the well, well, campaign it make, work. It makes them look bad as well. Well, of course. I mean, you know, we see it all the time on... Um, <laughs> Again, I always default to like Love Islands or Towies or something. You, know, you go on some t Towie person's page, and there's the most overtly salesy picture of them with some tooth whitening kit. Oh, yeah. And you look at all the posts that get hundreds of comments and 10, 15, 30,000 likes, and then they're there with gleaming teeth holding a toothbrush in. I just used this. Uh, you know, you've got to buy it. And it gets like 
six comments and 250 likes and it's because it's just so unauthentic so out of character yeah yeah you're right and and of course we've you know we, we've now got so much choice as to who we follow and why we like things one thing I will say uh, as a little piece of advice when I'm talking to my clients about this is think about what you do with your actions online so why do you like that content why do you share it why do you subscribe and make a mental note of what it is because there is a massive disconnect with what people do almost socially on their own and then what they then do in their own business why you know you know that that type of content really works you like it and yet you're just going back to doing the same old posts on linkedin or or Facebook, and you're thinking, yeah, we're just going to push this event out and hope it will fly. <laughs> but, you know, it, it isn't. You know, we're now in a very, very creative industry. It's, it's the attention economy more than anything else. You've got to create a really powerful hook that brings people in to your content matter. Do you think that as a, a retailer, a brand owner, um, you know, looking to work with influencers, do you think you're better off um, doing larger numbers of people for shorter spaces of time or maybe just using one or two influencers to build long-term relationships with so that they're posting about you constantly, uh, you know, you look much more aligned and also then I guess from your website and, you, and your other visuals, you know, you you can have their their pictures on there, their own landing pages and just make it look much more of a, a 360 experience. Absolutely. Well, the growth at the moment without a shadow of a doubt is in ambassador programs and those are pretty much what we call always on campaigns because, you know, I think there's a real m misnomer that when you post something you pay something for a post and then you're like right they're gonna the orders are gonna pour in <laughs> they're not the reality is unless somebody sees something at least seven times you know because that's what that's what the human brain likes to consider and take in things it's like for example on tv we don't go and we see somewhere on tv we don't go and rush out and see it straight mm -hmm. away do we we need we need multiple reminders of where that product is of course, the great thing about an influencer is they are a, an amazing case study because they're demonstrating it, they're showing it, they're creating something fun and lively about that product, which perhaps other forms of media are not doing. But um, the benefit with Ambassador, of course, is they are going to be getting involved in perhaps pre-product launches. So that gives them exclusive access to events. Uh, that they can then show to their audience. So remember, an influencer is 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 motivated not just by money, but by exclusive content. So if there's anything that a brand can do that can help the, that that influencer can only have, they're always interested in growing and engaging their audience because they're the people that have put them there. So anything that's going to help them do that. So it might be an affiliate. Yep. A discount. It might be some uh, competition prizes for their followers. It it might be ten tickets to London Fashion Week. It could be a whole number of different things. But it's really remembering what the influencers' motivations are, and also treat them as a human being. They have challenges and issues like the rest of us. So what what they don't like is to be treated like an employee. You know, they are smart people, they are creative, um, they are busy a lot of the time. And I think sometimes what I think is very frustrating is when lots of brands, they reach out on Instagram and they, they send a message like it could be an email to all. We think you'd be great for our brand. You know, this is what we are prepared to, we're offering a 10% discount, blah, 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 blah. And it just feels so false. You just know that that has been sent to all. Uh, you know, it's the reach out is a real skill from, an, from from my point of view. So I have this little approach called jab jab punch, effectively, which effectively is bit of Gary V. Dip, yeah, uh, like comment, like comment, engage, and that basically means is that you've already been perhaps even noticed by the influencer because you've been right saying some comments. So you're going to be part of maybe 20 comments as opposed to um, thousands of followers. Mm -hmm. um, you say something positive 
and then you do it again and then you reach out and say look i just wanted to say i've been following you for for a little while love your content it's really good we're working on a product for an exciting launch which i think uh, you'd be great for i wonder if we could set up a call to discuss more and you mentioned the ambassador programs I mean, t- almost looking at the opposite of that, because you, you've been talking about how good ambassador programs are, and that's where the industry is going. Would you go as far as to say that single posts for for businesses that have never worked with an influencer are almost a waste of budget? Hmm. Um, it depends, to be fair. It depends on the engagement rate of that influencer, and it depends on what the offer is. I'm not going to say no, but I'm just going to say it's a, it's a, it's about managing expectations. Lot of campaigns involve two things, so it's either a story and a post. So you've got a double hit uh, of of a campaign. A, a, a single post for a small influencer uh, may be more challenging. Um, what, what, sh- what should someone be expecting to pay for these posts? Oh, it depends on the size of the yeah. audience, to be honest. I mean, it can be a few hundred pounds, actually. So it can be very, very cost effective. Um, what I think is important is there are a number of variables that take into consideration that. So not just their follower level, their engagement rate, their level of follower interest. So you should always ask an influencer for a media pack, a media deck. And if they haven't got one, it's an amber flag. It's not a red flag, but it's an amber flag that says, you know, for the, the best and professional influencers that have collaborated and worked before and know what brands want have a media deck. And that, in that media deck, you'll be able to see which brands they've worked with before, what their social media footprint is, what their average engagement rate is, uh, some of the other campaigns that have that have been very successful for them and what they did. It depends. I mean, not all media decks are the same, but enough of a, what I call a CV for you to get a snapshot view of them. Because actually, when you look at somebody's Instagram, it can be, uh, you might not get a full picture of what's behind that yep. person. <laughs> so where, where's where's the industry going? Well, uh, lots of interesting things. Obviously, AI has been quite transformational. When you think about now, you can create posts in AI very very quickly you can uh, do a lot of really cool ideation when it comes to content Uh, and that's that's fascinating because that is all brain time Uh, you can use ai for the 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 processing of what goes on between influencers There's, there's actually quite a lot of back and forth between content approval and all that sort of stuff. So that is going to be much more streamlined. And there's some great tools out there that enable that to happen so that influencers work with brands quicker. Can, so they can pretty much turn it on very, very quickly. I mean, to a degree, it is a fast-paced industry anyway, and that's definitely possible even now. But I think AI is just going to transform that. Um, I think you know, social commerce has been a huge area of growth. So what we're now seeing is a lot more influencers, not just being seen at the top of the funnel, like brand awareness, but actually very much in the performance marketing category. So they're actually driving sales using affiliate links very, very successfully. And of course, having their own um, shopping channels. I mean, it's quite interesting to think that uh, Alibaba and Amazon in 2020 put out a call for 100,000 influencers because they realized they were great people to sell products uh, online um, because they'd already got a ready-made audience and they know how to communicate. And if if there was an affiliate link with Amazon, then why wouldn't they consider working with them? So I think that's really interesting. Um, the other thing, of course, is CGI, uh, computer-generated influencers. Um, there's a great uh, influencer called Lil Michaela, and she's got. Well, she's uh, not real. She's a she's a computer thing. Yeah, she's got over three million, maybe two point eight, three million followers, and it's a whole. Yeah, she's got. She has brand campaigns, everything. So right. it's really fascinating. But then we we like Batman. We like Marvel comic. You know, we we have a fascination because, you know, what fascinates me about people and characters is the emotional connection. That's what drives us to do stuff, you know? Um, I mean, obviously, there are some worries about whether or not AI will replace certain jobs. Of course, it will, but it will change the types of jobs. 
Um, in fact, I learned recently the most highly requested job at the moment is a prompt engineer, yeah. which is obviously the person that is designing the prompts. <laughs> um, but um, and, and tell me, for people looking to book influencers, would you suggest that they do it directly with influencers that they've identified, or do you think brands should be going to uh, influencer marketing agencies and, and working through agents? Um, I, I favor that, um, but that's not to say that that's the only, the only reason I favor that is because working with experts will, will yes, there's, there's money to pay them, but also, you know, they've, they've been and done it for, a, for a number of years. They know how it works. They know how to engage the influencers. They know how to find the right people. The reason I say that I met somebody a little while ago at a conference and he said, he spent hours and hours and hours trawling Instagram, trying to find the right people. And what I would say there is there's an opportunity cost. That is your time that you are using in a subject that you're not totally familiar with to trawl through loads and loads of people. You might like the aesthetic. You might be drawn to the number of followers and you think, right, that's the right person for us. Mm -hmm. But you don't know anything else about them. And that's the reason why there are influencer marketing platforms and tools which you can subscribe to, not only to access these influencers, but to get effectively all this data behind them. And then you can then um, work with them on that basis. So influencer agencies, influencer platforms. Uh, it's not to say you can't do it on your own, but it comes as, you know, sure. by like, like anything, like, like hiring any expert. Well, look, Gordon, it's been, it's been great to have you here. Uh, thank you for sharing breakfast with me. My pleasure. Just before we wrap up, just give me two or three super actionable comments uh, that that anyone listening today who who wants to either uh, be be an influencer themselves or employ an influencer in their business. I will tell you what. Give me one of each uh, can take away and implement right away. So I think uh, understand first of all your own market. You know, if you're in finance, you might wish to look at uh, LinkedIn and and people that are really on those platforms. Um, one thing I will say is start looking at your own content. If you understand the sector, when I talk about personal brands with people, it's a lot of it's to do with, you know, start with your own bio. Make sure that you are totally aligned with your core message. So don't, if you are a finance expert, then don't put out any other content that doesn't relate to finance. Yeah, so that's one of my real big tips is don't waver from that alignment. I call it the fairy on the Christmas tree. Whatever your subject matter is, make sure that everything points to that. Even if you're going to show an image of a pet, link it into finance. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I would say. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is be consistent with your posting. So, you know, even if it's 8 p.m. three times a week, it doesn't have to be every day. But if it's it should be the same time, uh, you look at the way that a film is promoted. It's promoted through a trailer. We get excited about it. So if you tell your audience you're going to show up on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, 8 p.m., you're priming them to be there. Yeah, that's what a lot of YouTubers do is they drive that. Um, and I think the other the last tip really in terms of working with influencers is um just just give it a go give it a give it a go but speak with them first and have a have a call tap into their knowledge and understand what you are trying to do and how how they, they think that they can help you achieve that so you are again totally aligned with the goals perfect well listen gordon it's been an absolute pleasure having you here thank you very much for bringing me this book and we'll be reading it on the plane tomorrow uh, and just before you go um i guess yeah give your website a plug tell people where they can find the book and anything else you want to share great um so yeah i'm on all the social networks gordon glenister um and it's handy because i think there's only one or two of me around in the world so that's quite handy and uh, my website is just gordonglenister.com perfect thanks again buddy thank you so much <laughs>